Many long-running manga series will have bonus chapters or side stories or extras or specials or whatever you want to call them throughout its publication. They're usually lighthearted in nature, exploring the downtime that's throughout the series, or their cute flashbacks or maybe even alternate universe stories. The possibilities are honestly quite endless, and Black Butler is no exception to this side story specials phenomenon. There are a couple of bonus chapters like the Devil Six chapter, which I've already made a video about, and the special Halloween chapter that I plan to make a video about this October, <laughs> which have made it into the physical releases of the manga. At, usually tacked on at the ends, uh, volume 22 for the Devil Six chapter and volume 24 for the Halloween chapter. However, there are a handful of other bonus chapters that were not included in the Black Butler volumes. Each of these were specials only included with DVD and Blu-ray releases. And when I say DVD and Blu-ray releases, these were exclusive to Japan. So it was pretty hard for international fans to get their hands on these special chapters. And as far as I can tell, the only English translations are fan translations. So today I wanted to sit down and share with you guys these Black Butler chapters you very likely may have never read, unless you read Black Butler on <laughs> some sort of slightly less than legal manga website that just includes all the side chapters anyway. Our first bonus chapter that didn't make it into the physical releases is chapter 96.5, The Butler Friendly. This was released with the Book of Circus DVD, and it's a bonus chapter that takes place during the circus arc, when Ciel and Sebastian were undercover at Noah's Ark Circus. This would have been one of those downtime chapters, showing us a conversation being held on the first night. Things start off pretty simple, with Freckle talking to Ciel in their tent, and basically dragging him out to eat dinner despite CL just wanting to take the world's fattest nap. <laughs> or I guess since it's nighttime, it would actually just be going to sleep. But the two head off into the like dining hall tent where they run into Joker, Dagger, and Peter, I think. <laughs> and the three first stringers are very welcoming to these younger kids. Because again, remember Freckle is around the same age as CL, I think. I think she might have been like a year or two older. I don't know if it was ever specified. But Joker invites the kids to eat with them and they all kind of sit down and just relax and have a little chit chat. <laughs> However, Joker does point out that there's not really like proper food. It's just like snack food. And he's like, ah, you guys can't have dinner on snacks. But like the wonderful capable butler that Sebastian is, he shows up with dinner for CL. <laughs> and he ends up joining the group for dinner. And of course, the circus troupe are like, oh wow, how do you know how to cook? Like, you were a butler, weren't you? Like, you were acting like a chef. And they don't know Sebastian wears many hats because he's a demon. <laughs> and Joker invites Sebastian to sit down with them and to have a drink, to which Sebastian's like, oh, I've never been drunk before, which yeah, I, I, I believe it. I believe that man has never had the experience of being drunk. And he words it very funnily, but that might just be the translation. <laughs> Um, Dagger does also invite CL to have a drink, which it's like, buddy, that is a 13 year old child, but okay. <laughs> but Peter steps in and is like, no, don't do that. Um, that's, that's gonna ruin his teeth, which, you know, that gets them talking about cavities and having their teeth being pulled. And CL's like, yeah, I don't have any more baby teeth. And I mean, again, he is 13, but I also... Actually, I think I was also no more baby teeth at 13. They dive into like the story of the tooth fairy and that if a tooth fell out and has no cavities while you're asleep, the tooth fairy will come and give you money for it. This is something that at least I know is shared in the US. <laughs> I feel like, if, I don't know if every culture has their own tooth fairy, but I know that I grew up with the tooth fairy stories. So this is very familiar to me. The Joker then crashes down on reality and he's like, I'm pretty sure that was just made up. The tooth fairy is made up to make kids brush their teeth, which yeah, makes sense. And then he's like, don't parents usually provide the coin? Which is like seeing this outside of the linear timeline of when this is taking place, we already know that Joker grew up on the streets with no parents with the rest of the troops. So they very much had to be their own tooth fairies <laughs> or at least Joker and the others took on that role for the younger members of their little group, specifically just Doll. <laughs> and Joker gets into a story about um, Doll and 
some of their experiences being the tooth fairy for doll. <laughs> he shares with Seal that they used to look pretty poorly back in the day, and we get a flashback to 10 years ago, to which doll has lost a tooth. Doll, Freckle, like, we, we already know by the time this chapter was released that they're the same person. So, it's very obvious in the flashback art that, like, Freckle and Doll are the same person. <laughs> I don't know why I was referring to her as Freckle. <laughs> but Doll has lost her tooth, and she believes in the Tooth Fairy. So, she's like, I'm gonna get my coin, and I promise I'm gonna buy you guys bread with my Tooth Fairy money. She's so pure, and just, like... I want the world for her, and I think I think Joker and some of the others feel the same way. But uh, Peter's like, no, are you stupid? Th like that's not real. But before he can really like give him the the lay down, <laughs> Jumbo's like, mm, don't don't burst this bubble, not yet. <laughs> and it's it's like really cute kind of tension, and now they're just like okay so how are we gonna how are we gonna fix this how are we gonna make sure that doll has the childhood worth that we want her to have basically that's what it boils down to <laughs> and beast is like yeah she's gonna be upset if she doesn't get any coin tomorrow um so joker's like i'm gonna go earn some coin i'll fi i'll figure this out <laughs> peter is very um pessimistic about the whole thing and he's like I guess we're just gonna steal like we always do but Joker's like that wouldn't that wouldn't be right it ruins the essence of the the uh, tooth fairy <laughs> he's like it's just a feeling but like ah, I don't I don't want to ruin the essence and Peter is like "Ugh, I hate kids which you know what fair <laughs> and then he's like, you know what? What if we all just try to go earn something? Let's all go. Let's all go attempt to provide for our younger sister character. And so they all are like super motivated to go out and like do some work. And we see Joker like doing some cleaning for um, like a tavern or something. And we see Jumbo moving boxes at a shipyard. We see Beast and another unnamed child like skinning potatoes or something like doing something food prep wise. And by the time the next morning rolls around, they're exhausted, but they did it. They got co they got that coin. <laughs> they got that coin. Doll is like fast asleep with her little tooth on a little like napkin next to her. It's so precious. Doll is ecstatic when she wakes up and found out that the tooth fairy really came and now the group can eat some bread. And it's just, it's such a cute, wholesome, like, this is such a family. This is such a family. I also, it just occurred to me, I forgot Dagger's not a natural blonde and that unnamed kid next to Beast was Dagger. I don't know why I, <laughs> I don't know why I forgot that. It took me seeing this full spread to realize my mistake. Um, but after that story, Sebastian's like, oh, what a wonderful story. Peter's like, what do you mean? What part of that was great? After that, she tried to take out all of her teeth and it wasn't even wobbly. Like that's just not great. And <laughs> Dagger's like laughing about it. He's like, yeah, I remember that. Um, and then Sebastian goes in on sharing a story about the young master of the manor he was working for, which, you know, is Ciel, who was sitting right there. And this was a story that happened about two years ago. 11-year-old Ciel has a little wobbly teeth and that's causing him to leave behind his favorite food because like eating with loose teeth, not a vibe. I do remember that being a pain. So Sebastian's like, oh, your tooth, which one? And so Ciel shows him and because Sebastian is a demon, he is not very gentle. And so he's like taking on the parental role of checking out this teeth and being like, oh, it's very wobbly and that must make it difficult to eat. So you know what he does? He's just gonna take it out right now. He's not gonna wait for it to come out. He goes, he takes his glove off, goes in there and grips that tooth to try to yank it out. I'm sure every one of us here watching this video has had loose teeth before. Like that's just kind of, I think every living creature sheds their first set of teeth. Um, you can't just yank that thing out as soon as it starts getting wobbly. You have to let it like basically come out on its own unless you're like getting it surgically removed for whatever reason like getting it pulled um but because it's not ready to come out it's it's not it's causing way more problems and you you know how it goes the circus troupe the first stringers are very much like i can't believe this butler did that and cl is also 
<laughs> there, it's complete silence. Silence has fallen over this table, and Sebastian's like, I mean, I thought I was doing him a favor, but the master was kind of grumpy and threw a fit, and he became angry with me, and ever since then, every time his tooth has started to wobble, he would never let me check it to see if there were any cavities, and... <laughs> <laughs> the first stringers are like, uh, yeah, I wonder why. And Sebastian's just talking about how much trouble he's had with that, and Dagger's like, wouldn't that be more trouble for the young master? Like, what do you, what do you mean you had trouble? Uh, the Sebastian then shares the obvious that he does not have childcare experience. <laughs> but Dagger's like, buddy, wouldn't you have had loose teeth too? Like, shouldn't you know? <laughs> To which Sebastian's like, yeah, it must be pretty inconvenient to to not be able to grow your teeth back as soon as they come out for humans. Kind of like dropping hints that he's a demon without directly saying he's a demon. But like in a way that I don't think Sebastian realizes that he's being peculiar. <laughs> but like everyone just kind of lets it slide and they're like, yeah, he's weird. That's a weirdo. That's a strange man. And that's kind of the end of it. <laughs> it's a very cute like dad bastion chapter for those of us who are delusional and enjoy reading the sebastian and cl dynamic as one of a like paternal figure i know there's issues with that dad bastion enjoyers just ignore all the weird sexualization and black butler <laughs> and i also really love how sebastian is just barely holding on to that human cover story but like everyone just lets him get away with it like he can't keep getting away with this <laughs> it doesn't really add much to the overall like understanding of black butler it doesn't really like add much characterization but it does just dig further into sebastian's struggles with adapting to being a caretaker and it shows us more of the human side to the circus members which i absolutely love because i miss the circus troupe every day of my life it's just i love the care that yana toboso has taken when showing us that the circus troupe they're not just kidnapping monsters they are people with struggles and care for each other and it's i love how she toes that line of humanizing the antagonist of this story for the most part <laughs> she doesn't humanize the predators which is fine but she humanizes just about everyone else and i think that's really interesting and i think this chapter does add to that and it's it's a nice little treat for those of us who enjoy the circus troupe our next bonus side chapter is chapter 99.5 the butler nursing this was also released with um, the book of circus dvd and it is also kind of linear taking place within the circus arc however this bonus chapter is a flashback to when cl was younger so like before all the trauma happened it's a very light-hearted story about him spending some quality time with his dad and diedrich at least that's how it's presented i am one of the i that's not that's the the twin in this chapter and i'll get to that in a second <laughs> this chapter takes place after um after CL has the asthma attack at the circus and then returns to the townhouse where Soma and Agni are like, you need to rest and get better. So it's taking place during that night where he is being nursed back to health. And it's the setup for it is that Sebastian is like taking care of him and it sparks a memory. And CL basically like reminisces to Sebastian um, about a time where his mother was being nursed back to health after having like a sickness or like some sort of asthma related illness that's like the assumption we're led to make here um <laughs> it's a really cute chapter but yeah things start off with ciel and sebastian in the townhouse and he's getting his dinner <laughs> and it's when sebastian tries to feed it to him and he's like N -n -n what don't don't do that stop <laughs> um but then the meal itself sparks the memory and Sebastian at first is like, wait, what's what's going on with the meal? Like, do you not like it? And he's like, no, it's, it's good. It just reminds me of this one thing that happened six years ago. And then we lead into the flashback where Rachel is coughing and one of the CLs, I, th I think this is our CL who's like, oh no, mom, are you, are you okay? Are you good? And Vincent's there and he's like, oh, having a jaunt on the boat today would have been 
a little much so like maybe we'll just do that another time because i guess they were planning on just going and hanging out on a boat which you know what rich people activities i guess <laughs> so they take rachel's temperature they ask about her appetite and she's like i don't have one but then they're like girly you gotta eat you have to like you have to do something and vincent's like i i have an idea I have an idea and it's gonna be easy to digest and like we we can do this as vincent is trying to decide what they're going to prepare for rachel real cl you can tell the difference because they're like bangs part differently this is a different kid from the first the pa a page ago um real cl comes up and he's like lemon honey cough drops are pretty tasty and vincent's like that's that's not a meal <laughs> That's not a meal, but like, are you are you eating the cough drops, bestie? Are you are you um eating cough drops like they're candy? I remember being told I shouldn't do that as a kid. <laughs> but then Vincent's like, oh wait, no, that's actually pretty baller. CL, let's let's do something that's even more fun than a boat trip. And Vincent is like, let's let's play house. And I love that. I love that for them. So they call up Diedrich, and <laughs> I <lo> the implication. <laughs> that Vincent calls up Diedrich to play house with him and his child. I'm a, I'm a dirty Diedrich Vincent shipper, I guess. They're just so funny to me. <laughs> but Diedrich shows up and Vincent's playing chess with Ciel, which is like kind of funny because that, I know six years ago he would have been like seven. Seven's still pretty young to play chess, actually. <laughs> Seven's pretty young. Um, but Vincent's like, oh, Diedrich, it's been a while. How convenient that you're here. And, <laughs> Dietrich's like, I'm only here because I changed my plans to return to Germany because you told me that you had urgent business. And Vincent gets really serious and he's like, actually, there is something I would love to ask of you. To which Dietrich is like, oh, okay. And they have a cute little shoujo moment and Vincent's like, that food that you made me one time when I was sick, let's make it again. Let's, let's pull out our greatest hits. <laughs> He's like, you remember that one thing you made for me at school? Like, we gotta, we gotta do it. Roll it back. Roll it back. Diedrich is not excited about this. And, <laughs> and then he's like, that's because you told me taking care of sick people is drudge work. I'm, I'm using the word that they use in the anime. Sorry for people who get upset about that. I just, as I said in my Weston video, I don't really want audio clips of me saying that going out of context because that's not really a slur i can reclaim nor do i feel comfortable slaying it saying it even though in this context it's not a slur i explained it in that video i'm a yeah um so he's like you told me that was drudge work that's the only reason i did it i did it against my will <laughs> but vincent's like it was just so good it was so good and tasty i want my family to taste it too <laughs> i love their dynamic they're D poor diedrich <laughs> <laughs> Dietrich is like, this is not that big of a deal. You called me here for this. And Vincent's like, trivial. So you're saying that you wouldn't care if my beloved family were to die? Is that foreshadowing? <laughs> Dietrich's like, I didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. And then Vincent, playing on the heartstrings, turns to CL and is like, old man Dietrich is awful, isn't he? <laughs> They're the same age. Diedrich is like, don't call me an old man. And Ciel, poor little Ciel, is like, oh, mom's cough sounds really bad. I want her to get better quickly. I know, this is a this is a seven-year-old, and he's probably being so genuine. But the way that it also kind of seems like real Ciel is playing into Vincent, like they play off each other so well, is so funny to me. <laughs> like father, like son, truly. <laughs> Diedrich does bring up the fact that, like, hey, don't you have a, a cook, a chef, whose job is to do this? And Vincent's like, yeah. So? Don't they say that the most important ingredient is love? <laughs> and Diedrich and Vincent have this little moment where he's like, love? You? Like, you can feel love? Which I think is kind of wild, because I do genuinely believe Vincent loved his family. I think there was a lot of genuine care and, um admiration and love and adoration that that man held for his family and i do think vincent cared about diedrich in some kind of way i don't know what way would actually be canon but i do think he did genuinely enjoy diedrich's company and genuinely trusted diedrich 
I mean, obviously we've seen that the, he trusts Diedrich basically wholeheartedly. <laughs> and Diedrich just gets dragged along. So they go and he's like, you're already here, so you might as well help us. And Tanaka like sees this kind of going down and he has like a little like, oh, okay. Which I love the inclusion of Tanaka. It's so inconsequential, but it's just a fun little thing, like seeing that he was definitely there. We then transition to the three of them being in the kitchen and they're all dressed up to cook and little CL has like such a cute little chef's outfit and again this is real CL you can tell by the direction of the bangs but they look the part and now they're ready to cook. Diedrich pulls out the manual and he's like first things first we gotta clean this place up <laughs> and Vincent's like yeah no I expected that from a German but they are making non-sweet milcherets which suits the English palate and um I Eintopf? I don't know if I said that right, but it's like a a German pot. It, okay. It like the area of the comic where it like specifies what it is. So like Milcheries is a German type of milky risotto. Um and it's like it also says that it's typically seasoned with um sugar and cinnamon. Sounds so tasty. It says Ein, um Eintopf is a German pot de fou. I don't know what that is. <laughs> And then they're making apple uh, compote for dessert. I don't think I said that right at all. Dietrich is, I'm like, do you guys, do you guys even know how to like use kitchen utensils? And Vincent's like, I'm, I'm not terrible at handling knives because we know he's probably killed people. <laughs> and Ciel has played house with Lizzie, so like they're super well equipped, right? <laughs> Dietrich doesn't think they are. Diedrich does not think they are. They measure out the ingredients, and Diedrich is very, very thorough. <laughs> And it's just, it's so cute. It's such a cute chapter. But then it stops being cute for a second when Vincent's like, please call me by my first name. You've never done it before. And Diedrich is like, I don't know. No. Spare me your tedious talk and go tie up the pork. To which Vincent gets very, I don't know if I want to say serious, but he's like, hog tying is my specialty. And like, Dietrich's like, please don't put it like that because it does sound like it's it's okay. So what this either is, it's it's either a joke about Vincent getting a little freaky, a little kinky, or it's a joke about Vincent getting a little um good at or being good at tying people up for more malicious intent. A callback to the watchdog role that we know he has, and we know the watchdog role puts the watchdog in positions where they have to kill people or tie people up or you know like they have to do some nefarious things we know that already so we we may not know exactly what all vincent has done but we can make some pretty good guesses based on what we have seen cl do and based on how people react to cl doing things and be like oh you're just like your father but after vincent got a little weird cl's like oh i want to do that too because kids want to be like their parents um, <laughs> so Vincent is teaching Ciel how to hogtie, basically. You know, real- I really want to know what real Ciel would have been like if he got to grow up. <laughs> that I- that would have been so interesting. Cooking the meal goes pretty well, they've managed, and Vincent shares that this is his first time ever cooking, uh, but he does find it fun. Which, you know what? Good for him. Cooking can be a fun hobby. It doesn't taste good, though. He's not good at it. He might have had a good time, but it tasted like ass. Diedrich is like, you know what? I, I gotta save this. We we can still save this. We can come back from this. And so Diedrich kind of takes over, and that leaves Vincent and Ciel a moment to really just sit down and talk about what's going on. And Vincent, talking about Diedrich, says that he's pretty reliable, isn't he? As And Ciel is like, what's a drudge? Like, what do, you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? To which Vincent explains that um, they're sort of like brothers while you're in public school. Something that most of us readers would have already known at the time. Because, again, this chapter came out well after the Western arc had finished. And Vincent goes on to explain basically the role of the drudge. And talks about how Diedrich is a pretty special case. And as they keep talking, Vincent brings up the fact that Ciel will likely also go to Weston. And at some point will also have a drudge for himself. To which Ciel responds, he doesn't need them. He gets really serious in a panel that a lot of people refer to when theorizing what real Ciel's personality would be like. And 
he says that he does not need fake brothers. I'll, I'll swing back to this after the chapter recap. <laughs> um, this kind of like shocks Vincent a little bit, but he's like, okay, yeah, you don't, you don't need fake brothers. That's fair. <laughs> and Diedrich is like, okay, please, please stop talking. Please come help me. And they just get back to it. And eventually they're able to provide this wonderful home cook, loving meal for sweet dear Rachel. <laughs> and she is very happy to eat their home cooking and she gives it a try and it's very delicious and they're just those two are the best aren't they the best husband and the best child award goes to vincent and ciel for real for real and rachel's like yeah i think i'm gonna be super better like i'm i'm gonna be so good so healthy so slay and ciel is very happy to hear that and then he runs off to play some chess by himself i do want to add this chapter came out before um the twin was officially revealed <laughs> so if you're reading this not believing about the twin theory you're like okay lonely child i guess <laughs> or he's playing with servants is i guess the assumption some people would make rachel says that she is feeling better already and after seeing her child do so well like that just that feels so nice for her and vincent's like yeah you're still recovering though so you can't go back to having fun just yet like keep it keep it easy finish healing we then see ciel it's kind of hard to tell which ciel because the part's just straight down the middle but we do know that our ciel was the sickly child so it's a fair assumption that this is our ciel and he is coughing and tanaka shows up and he's like oh oh no excuse me <laughs> you you good and then we see what's pretty clearly our CL because of the bang part amidst a room full of toys. Toys that are very obviously meant for two children because why does one child need duplicates of things and why does one child have a lot of multiplayer games? Tanaka points out that it's just like a toy store in there and <laughs> CL's like, sorry, Gramps. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Tanaka has like a fun little like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just happy to see you're doing well kind of implying that one twin was sick while the other one wasn't. I mean, that's just quite literally what's going on. Um, but Ciel has managed to eat a lot today and Tanaka is very happy to see that. And Ciel asks about his mom because this Ciel, our Ciel doesn't know what has been going on during this day because he has been trying to heal and get better himself, just like Rachel. And Tanaka explains that Rachel has eaten as well, has partaken to the very last bite. You could read this as one child being there and he's asking about if his mom enjoyed the food and finished it, or you could read it as there's two children and one of them like kind of knows what was going on that day and wants to know how it went. That's how I, that's, that's how I'm reading it, but I also like, I'm reading this with future knowledge of knowing there's a twin and RCL kind of has a moment where he's he's sitting there and he's thinking or I guess he says this aloud but he's he's thinking like wouldn't it be great if we could all have fun on the boat tomorrow like if we all get so much better and we can go do our little boat jaunt <laughs> and then we come back to the present day where CL is um follows up with his fever returned the next day and they couldn't go out on the boat together <laughs> that's so sad Sebastian takes this whole nostalgia trip though as a um so like does this food bring back your memories like is this meal just like a memory bringer back or whatever to which ciel basically has to describe the concept of nostalgia basically it's because that there was only the only time that he saw one of his parents cooking so it was very memorable to him and that's the only reason he remembered it it's not really a memory bringer backer the way sebastian is making it sound sebastian's so silly sometimes um, then Ciel is like, yeah, that was pointless. Ignore all that. But Sebastian thought it was interesting, and I personally found it interesting. And whether it's about Ciel's condition or about his memories, Sebastian wants to know it all. And like, me too, bestie. Me too, for real, for real. Sebastian starts to say that knowing about all of this could be convenient, but it is Ciel that finishes it up, because at this point, they've been around each other for at least a couple of years. So he kind of knows the demon pretty well. And Sebastian's like, yeah, you're right. 
and it does make sense like if you know these things that bring the person you're taking care of comfort like you know all these little things about them it is easier and more convenient to basically take care of them or comfort them if they needed it although i don't think sebastian's ever tried to emotionally comfort ciel ever in his life <laughs> but ciel's like yeah no that makes sense it's part of your aesthetic right and you know what true and the two of them basically they have their one hell of a butler moment <laughs> And so Ciel's like, I'm ready to move on from the past. We don't need it. All we need are the present and the future as the two of them walk off of, into the distance. <laughs> this is so funny because I know, like, this chapter is very clearly supposed to be taking place um, kind of in the moment right before or right after Ciel is, like, starting to get a little bit better and right before they leave the townhouse to go investigate Baron Kelvin. <laughs> And so, like, it ends pretty dramatically, but it is a very fun chapter that I loved when it came out. But yeah, going back to I don't need fake brothers, Real Ciel as a character is one that we don't really know super well. We've only met his character through flashbacks and very brief interactions post-twin reveal. And this chapter is one that a lot of people turn back to because... Spoilers? Here is your spoiler warning. I am about to spoil a major character death. A major character death that happens in the blue cult arc. Here is your spoilers. If you want to avoid spoilers, I will place the time to skip to right here. Consider yourself spoiler warned. If you are one of my IRLs, skip this part. <laughs> So people take this I don't need fake brothers sentiment and they really run with it when we get to the part where we know that Soma and Agni were attacked in the townhouse. Right before the twin reveal, Agni gets, you know, murdered and there for a time, a lot of people speculated that like motivations for this murder might be tied to real CL wanting to eliminate all the brotherly like figures in CL's life because we do know Soma and CL are very close and they have a very um brotherly dynamic I know I refer to them as like cousin coded a lot <laughs> um but they cousin coded and sibling dynamics are essentially the exact same thing <laughs> They are very close, but it's like the kind of friendship where it is more like familial than it is two people who are genuinely friends. Um, so we know this about Ciel and Soma's relationship. And when people see real Ciel in the past as a seven-year-old child say, I don't need fake brothers. It gives him somewhat of a Yandere-esque vibe. At least that's how people run with it. I don't know if that's the correct read on his character. I have not reread the flashback arc since it dropped. So I don't really have all my thoughts together on what I think real CL is actually like. Um, but it is an interesting point back to, and for the longest time, it was our only frame of reference of who this character is, what this character is like, because we don't see him very often, especially for context, this chapter, the 99.5, came out during the Green Witch arc going on. So, very, very little real CL going on. <laughs> and right after the twin got officially revealed, we were all running back to this chapter being like, that's the kid, that's him. <laughs> so, that is like the main thing that this chapter really adds to the overall Black Butler experience. But other than that, it's just another like cute, downtime a little flashback to i guess add more to vincent and diedrich's dynamic as well it adds a lot to vincent vincent is another character that we quite literally only see in flashbacks so the more little like even if it's inconsequential and not a very important moment for the story even a little bonus chapter like this does so much for the vincent lovers out there so this one had a lot more like meat to it <laughs> than the last one and it's it's so interesting this one gets talked about a lot um i feel like if anybody knows about the bonus chapters like this is the main one they know about this is the one that has like stayed within the, the like black butler fandom the most it gets talked about the most for sure or at least it did um 
10 years ago. The next chapter that we have to go through is chapter 101.5, The Butler Requested. This chapter is one that was released with the Book of Murder DVD release, and it is a bonus side story to the Book of Murder arc, and it's in Arthur's point of view. We love Arthur Conan Doyle. We love the anime boyification of real life historical figures. <laughs> Um, but this chapter follows Arthur as he tries to come up with ideas for another story to write. And it's honestly pretty cute. It starts off with Arthur just kind of sitting at his desk and he's like, Ugh, I failed again. <laughs> Historical stories about knights and chivalry is not it. Um, his story, he's, he's having a hard time getting stories uh, accepted to be published. But he was told like, hey, if you like, if you really like knights, if you really want to write about these things, why don't you try to write fables for children? And Arthur's, he's thinking about that and he doodles a little picture of Ciel. Me too. Um, <laughs> but he's thinking about this kid. Ciel is likely the only child Arthur really knows. Um, but Ciel is not the type to read children's stories. I mean, he is a a grown, grown child at the, the big age of 13. That is sarcasm, by the way. This gets Arthur thinking about what kind of stories he read as a child, because using Ciel as a reference, Ciel is not your average kid. <laughs> as he's thinking about this, Arthur dozes off and is now dreaming. He is dreaming about his childhood uh, fairy tales. <laughs> We start things off with a little parody of The Little Mermaid, where Arthur basically wakes up on a beach and he sees Grell washed up, and Grell is a beautiful, beautiful mermaid who really wants to meet her prince. However, Arthur is not the prince she is looking for. A little comedic transphobia, I guess. Arthur yells out, ah, a monster! Which, you know, like, mermaids are basically sirens, which quite literally are monsters. Although, I don't think that's the joke that was being made here. Grell is very upset by that, or maybe mildly upset. And she's like, I'm a respectable mermaid princess of the mer people, actually. This is quite literally Ariel. <laughs> and then, um, Arthur's like, princess? To which Grell is really wants to focus on the fact that she's a mermaid <laughs> which is kind of funny and it's it's basically a little mermaid parody kind of or a callback to the little mermaid we know yana Toboso is a disney girly grell then explains that she is the youngest and the sexiest of the mer sisters because this is grell and of course she would say that um she then explains that she saw a human prince near the seashore and it was love at first sight it's basically the story of the Little Mermaid with Undertaker being Ursula, which is honestly slay. And I think our main point of reference for what Undertaker looks like without his clothes on. So like, that's a fun thing for the Undertaker lovers. We also get a reveal that William is the prince. Um, prince Eric, I think is the actual character's name in The Little Mermaid. It, it's literally just Disney parodies and it's such a good time. So Arthur gets strangled by mistake. Grell is very overexcited and strangles Arthur, and then he transitions to the woods, where the double Charles approach him and basically introduce themselves as hunters that protect the forest, and they want to know about the wolves. They're talking about the wolves. Also, this was coming out during Green Witch arc, so this also low-key feels like a Green Witch reference. <laughs> like the wolves? The wolves, you say? The evil miasma of the, of the woods? <laughs> Um, this is a Little Red Riding Hood with Ciel and Sebastian being Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf, respectively. But they come up and they're like, to be held at knife point before a greeting, don't you think the hunters are more dangerous? They're like playing with Arthur's mind here. And they explain that they're on a mission to deliver the queen, who is supposed to be Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother, her food. And this, this actually... I don't think I've ever read this chapter before making this video. Like, I'm pretty sure I haven't. But like, maybe I have, and that's why that's why I think the queen is very grandma coded, even though I also think she's the big bad of the series. <laughs> or definitely not to be trusted. Um, so that's kind of fun. But Arthur 
immediately recognizes Little Red Riding Hood as the Earl of Phantom Hive. <laughs> to which Ciel is like, how do you know my name? Not an Earl though, but how do you know my name? We get a very Black Butler-esque spin on Little Red Riding Hood. And instead of Red, Little Red Riding Hood being a very like damsel in distress kind of gal, in this iteration, Little Red has tamed ferocious wolves and hunts those beasts that threaten the village. That's like, it's watchdogifying Little Red Riding Hood, which I think is like a really fun creative spin on it and definitely like adapts Black Butler into it very well. Like it ties it all in together very nicely. Also just furry versions of the Phantom Hive Servants is kind of nice. And I do think it's really funny that Finny is like up front, like the main one CL is gonna lean on. I don't know if that's foreshadowing for anything, or maybe it's a cute little like reference back to Finny being the main caretaker for CL during his PTSD attack in the Green Witch arc. It's just, it's such a cute thing. <laughs> One of the Charles is like, yeah, legend has it, the hood has been dyed red from the blood of the beasts he kills, which kind of freaks Arthur out. <laughs> And Ciel explains that he's only wearing it because the queen has told him to, and he's not wearing the red hood for fun. Unlike those hunters over there, Sebastian is a very tame wolf, and he wants us to know about that. As long as the contract between the young master and him exists, yada yada yada, it's basically Black Butler canon adapting to the Little Red Riding Hood story. Honestly, this would make really fun Halloween costumes. Not me coming up with Halloween costumes while I'm reading Black Butler. <laughs> Ciel decides it's time to move on. Enough with the chit chat. And as he leaves, Arthur tries to chase him, but he falls off of a cliff backwards and gets transported into Cinderella, where Siglende is Cinderella. Lau is the prince for some reason, carrying around the glass slipper looking for someone to wear it. <laughs> We then get a little, like, snippet of Peter Pan where Joker is Captain Hook and his right hand is eaten by a crocodile and Peter Pan is- Peter and Wendy are Peter and Wendy from Peter Pan. And then we move on to Snow White. I hate this, <laughs> but also, like, it's kind of fun to see all the Western boys again. We've got, um, Clayton, Edward, Cheslock, Violet, um, Redmond, Bluer, and Greenhill as, like, the seven dwarves and- Harcourt, unfortunately, is Snow White, with the Viscount being the prince who wants to have a pass passionate French kiss. Um, the nasty kind. <laughs> but Harcourt's already awake. Snow White's already awake. It's, it's, um, of course we have to make jokes about the Viscount being creepy. It's not a Black Butler chapter if you don't include that. And then we jump to an Aladdin parody, which very obviously going to be Soma and Agni, the, well, not only characters of color because Lau is Chinese and also Mei Ren is Chinese, but we don't know that until her backstory arc. <laughs> but Soma and Agni are Aladdin and the genie. And it's just like a fun little, like going through all the classic fairy tales, all the classic Disney movies basically, and black butlerifying them. And then we get to Lizzie, who is waking Arthur up because he'll freeze to death. I don't really know right offhand what this is supposed to be referencing. If this is a um, Frozen reference. It also low-key reminds me of Sharkboy and Lava Girl with the Ice Princess. But then also, also reminds me of the Ice King from Adventure Time if he were to be successful. I don't know. Maybe it's an, its own original thing, or based off of a lot of different things. But Arthur wakes up to Lizzie, who is explaining that they are in the land of the Ice King. And she introduces herself as Elizabeth, but do call her Lizzie, because Arthur's never met Lizzie before. <laughs> um, she then explains, or Arthur first asks, Ice King, don't you mean queen? Because this is clearly referencing something, I feel like, that would normally be a queen. Which makes me think about Frozen, which was out at the time of this chapter being released, but like, I don't know. Please let me know if you know what this is referencing. I would love to know. I don't know my fairy tales as well as I should. <laughs> Lizzie explains that the Ice King lives in the castle up ahead. It's a gorgeous castle. Yana Toboso is really, really good at um, what she does. <laughs> I love, I love her art. 
Lizzie then explains that she has to go save her childhood friend who is within the castle, and Arthur says he'll come as well, and that is very reassuring to hear. Um, he then wants to know what the childhood friend was like, and Lizzie explains that Ciel was such a cute and sweet child, but one day, shard, um, a shard of the devil's mirror stabbed his heart and his eye. Ever since then, he's become such a cold boy who can't trust anyone. This is basically Lizzie explaining her point of view of what happened to CL in canon. And yeah, that's just Lizzie's point of view from what literally happened. She then explains that CL was kidnapped by the Ice King who trapped him in his heart of darkness. And that's why she's here to bring him back. This feels a little bit like foreshadowing from the fact that um, CL is trying to save Lizzie from the Sphere Music Hall in the Blue Cult arc. And it also feels like it could be foreshadowing for Lizzie to want to maybe potentially help the Undertaker or real CL break our CL's contract to save him from the grim fate that meets him, to save him from the demon that he has sold himself to. I could very easily see Lizzie wanting to do that. Is that what Yana Toboso is going to do with the story? I don't know. But I can very easily see that happening, especially with the way that she has built up The Undertaker having a very emotional investment in the Phantom High family, and the way that we know Lizzie is very, very protective of those that she loves. She might feel betrayed in canon right now, because RCL is not who he said he was, but I think once she gets over that shock and betrayal, she could very easily want to break the contract if she knew about it. So that's what I feel like this is saying or this is how i'm reading this little bonus chapter we then meet sebastian who is the ice king and he's like kidnapping makes me sound like an awful person and like low-key he's slaying i have never thought sebastian was more beautiful than in this moment <laughs> he then explains that ciel came to him of his own volition which you know is technically true um he then calls ciel out who enters the room and he's adapted beautifully to the world of ice he has he's doing it he's doing his thing he then asks lizzie why she's there and he says that he wanted her to stay by the windowsill with the blooming roses ciel wants lizzie to stay safe ciel wants lizzie to stay disconnected from the pain and from the sorrow and from the coldness of the real world he does not want her to experience what he has experienced, the trauma that has turned him into the closed off person that he now is. I'm reading a lot into a silly little fairy tale side story, but that's what it says to me. And that I, I feel like this ties back to canon so well in a very fun way. This is a basically this is a character study. This is a character study of Ciel and Sebastian's dynamic. <laughs> and Lizzie as well. Um Lizzie wants to go home though, but Ciel shares that that is impossible. His heart has frozen and his eye belongs to the devil. He can never go back. Not to the beautiful roses, nor the warm gardens, nor what life was like before the attack on the Phantom Hive Manor. Arthur yells out that it's not true and that he doesn't have to give up. He can always try again. He's only 13. <laughs> What do you mean your eye only sees a barren, icy world? <laughs> you have so much life left ahead of you. But Ciel turns back towards the devil, choosing the path that he is already committed to and gives his goodbyes to the professor and to Lizzie. Sebastian then says that Ciel chose the world of the Ice King and that Lizzie, daughter of the sun, needs to go home. And that Arthur should have no time to be writing such a fairy tale as this. He should be writing about a cynical and smart and addicting d dilettante? I don't know how to say that word. Um, basically, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> the adventure of a protagonist who is an able detective. This is the birth of Sherlock Holmes. Sebastian has come to Arthur in his dreams and is like, hey, buddy, bestie, I know of a baller story you could write. And my child, the young master, this kid that we both seemingly care about that i'm pretending to care about um it really wants to read this book please write it 
At this rate, you're not gonna be able to meet the deadline. Write this book for CL, please. <laughs> and Arthur wakes up with this, with this motivation and this drive. And he's like, you know what? Yeah, that was a strange dream. But like, let's, let's try it out. CL would love a detective story. And Sherlock Holmes is born. That's the origin story of Sherlock Holmes. That's canon to the Black Butler universe, at least. <laughs> this chapter is so silly, but I feel like it does really explore a lot about um, CL and Lizzie's dynamic and situation. And it's just a fantastical spin on the already existing dynamics within Black Butler and the, I guess, the heartache that we see CL go through and the the way that Arthur just really wants what's best for this kid. Jeez. <laughs> it doesn't add anything to the story, but it is basically a retelling of the story that already existed at the time. And it, I just really like it. I really like seeing the canon dynamics in this twisted up form and exploring characters like this, at least for me, exploring characters in alternate universes or applying canon to a different story entirely in the way that this chapter is portrayed i feel like does a lot for setting up what makes a character who they are at their core what makes a dynamic what it is at its core it strips back the frills and the bows of black butler and it shows us just what exactly is going on what exactly is ciel and sebastian to each other who are they what is their contract that's what does this mean for the child? That's basically what this is. And I thought that was such a fun little like exploration of their characters. I really liked it. I've talked way too much about this chapter. <laughs> chapter 131.5, The Butler Resting, is the bonus chapter that was released with the Book of Atlantic DVD slash Blu-ray. At the time of writing this, as far as I'm aware, this is the last bonus side special chapter like this. Um, so let's dive into it. What is this chapter? <laughs> Who is resting? And is it truly the butler? This bonus chapter is basically a continuation of the Book of Atlantic after the mishap on the luxury liner. CL did promise Sebastian a day of rest and this chapter is that day of rest. <laughs> Things start off with CL telling Sebastian that like, yeah, you really are getting your vacation, which surprises Sebastian because again, he's a demon. He doesn't actually need it, but CL feels bad. He's He explains that even a demon is not immune to the Reaper's death size. So you need to take your time to heal because you need to be perfect. It's a problem if you are still healing. So you should take the time to rest, take the day off. And Sebastian at first is like, is that gonna be an order? To which CL says, yes, yes it is. So the next day rolls around and the rest of the servants, Finian, Bard, Min, uh, Mayren, Snake, and Tanaka greet Sebastian. They tell him that they hope he's okay. They wanna know, they wanna know what's going on. They ask, like they let him know, like we heard you're not feeling well, are you okay? Like, good, good morning. <laughs> Is there anything you need? Like, what can we do to help you? Because they genuinely love and care about Sebastian. To them, Sebastian is a part of their found family. And they're very concerned when somebody is not feeling their best. But they go into what's basically a human-esque plank on the bed. And <laughs> they, they're like, why are you sleeping in uniform? What is going on? <laughs> to which Sebastian is like, yeah, I don't... I don't have pajamas. I don't have nightwear. <laughs> Which then leads to the question, what do you usually sleep in? Because they don't know Sebastian doesn't actually normally sleep. To which Mayrin um, fantasizes about Sebastian sleeping in the nude. Good for her, I guess. <laughs> um, and that's just, things are a little silly. And Bard gives Sebastian his own pajamas because out of all the ones that work there. I think Bard is the closest in physicality to Sebastian. So Bard is like, here, take this bestie. However, Sebastian is taller than Bard. <laughs> and the, the servants have like a little laugh about it, but they're doing their best and they wanna make sure Sebastian has like a good well rest and is able to recuperate and feel his best. So 
They promise him that they he can leave everything to them, which has never gone badly, has it? <laughs> So Sebastian lays in bed, I and mean, it is an order after all, but as he lays in bed, mishaps occur. Aprons get caught on fire, things happen in the garden. Okay, actually, things don't really happen in the garden. Finny just picks the roses for Sebastian. He's so, he's just, he wants what's best for the people he cares about. But this does annoy Sebastian because they had plans. Um, but more urgently, Mei Rin mixes up the wheat flour and the detergent, which, you know, it causes a huge mess. And <laughs> this really stresses Sebastian out, which ends up making things worse. And he's like, I would have preferred to just work normally if this was how things were going to go. And icing on top of the cake, Lizzie barges in. Lizzie is very concerned about Sebastian because I think Lizzie sees how important Sebastian is to CL. She sees how while Sebastian may be a butler, he is also basically a parental figure for her cousin. So in a way that would kind of make Sebastian like an uncle figure for Lizzie. And the way she barges into the servants quarters tells me that Lizzie genuinely cares about the Phantom Hive staff. She I'm sure she cares about her own staff, but we see her care for the Phantom Hive staff as if they're family. And that's basically how it gets treated. Sebastian tells her that that's not really appropriate for her and she, she shouldn't do that. <laughs> but Lizzie doesn't care. She wants Sebastian to get well soon, so she brought him a gift. An old lady grandma nightgown and a nightcap. <laughs> It's so silly and Lizzie loves it. She thinks it suits him very well and that he can now look cute while resting because that's what's important here. Ciel thinks this is hilarious and you know what? Me too. It's so silly. He's got his little bunny slippers on. Like Sebastian looks so goofy. And that's the point. This chapter is basically just slice of life comedy. <laughs> the mishaps of a demon butler. At the end of the day, Sebastian just, he couldn't do it. He had to get up and he had to help the servants. Like, he, he couldn't lay there and listen to things go wrong and not do anything about it. Um, <laughs> he then returns to his room at the end of the day to find Ciel sitting there, wanting to know how the rest of his rest day went. Sebastian then explains that things didn't really go according to plan and he ended up helping out remedy a lot of accidents that happened throughout the day and... Ciel is fine with it. He's like, yeah, that's fine. Here's dinner. I brought you dinner, by the way. <laughs> and at first, Sebastian's like, did you make this yourself? Which would have been a really fun callback to the chapter where Vincent, Diedrich, and real Ciel made Rachel dinner when she wasn't feeling well. But our Ciel's like, no, of course not. I don't do things like cooking. <laughs> it, we then find out that it was Snake and Tanaka that made it. And Ciel just brought it in because they said that Ciel's appreciation would please Sebastian the most. Which I think would be true if Sebastian was a human man and not a demon just trying to cook a meal. <laughs> but it is really cute to see Snake and Tanaka put forth care and want to take care of Sebastian and nurse him back to health. Ciel then asks if demon fatigue can be cured by resting and eating and just, you know, normal things that would help a human get better. And Sebastian explains that human food wouldn't really do it for him, but if it was a human soul, then yeah, that should work. <laughs> and Ciel takes this in stride. He's like, I, I think you're trying to be scary right now, but it's not working because you look ridiculous. <laughs> this is a blow to Sebastian's ego. Ciel then basically orders Sebastian to rest and be comfortable, and Sebastian gets into bed looking like an elderly lady who needs to be on bed rest. <laughs> and Ciel's looking pretty proud of himself because he's essentially just humiliating this demon that he has a hate, um, acquaintanceship with. I was gonna say a love-hate relationship with, but I don't think that at all accurately describes their dynamic, at least not for me. Ciel then explains that it is very amusing to see Sebastian in this state, which Sebastian's like, yeah, no, I figured. I figured that's what this was about. <laughs> they then say that the cruise ship was the worst trip ever, but seeing Sebastian in this ridiculous appearance makes the whole thing worth it, which I think is so funny, and I don't think that's actually true, but I get what Ciel is saying here. 
<laughs> and Sebastian's like, yeah, don't worry about it. And this is never gonna happen again. I'm so sorry, but we're not doing this. It turns out the porridge that was made for Sebastian was super sweet, which he doesn't really like that. He hates that actually. It was just not super great. Like it was porridge that probably would have been really good for CL, but not Sebastian. And as far as I can tell, that is the end of the chapter. It's a very lighthearted, just very reminiscent of the first few chapters of the manga where it's very much slice of life, but things go wrong. And it's Sebastian trying his best to hold on to whatever ounce of sanity you can say he has. <laughs> it's very, it's very cute and very silly. And it doesn't really add anything to the overall story of Black Butler, but again, it's nice little downtime and it it's further just like it's breathing room basically it's breathing room and downtime that lets us see these characters that we love interact with each other in ways that we've pretty much already seen them interact but it's nice to see it again and it's nice to see these more friendly dynamics reinforced and explored in a silly way <laughs> As I said earlier, at the time of writing and recording this video, there are no other side chapters. No more bonus chapters. I don't know if that's going to change with the physical release of the Weston anime adaptation. I already know the Blu-rays and DVDs have been announced, but as far as I could tell, I haven't seen any information on if there's going to be bonus chapters. And I honestly kind of doubt that there will be because Yana Toboso is on hiatus right now. And she's working on twisted wonderland which i don't believe was a factor when um the book of atlantic dvds or like the Mur book of murder book of circus when those were released i i think book of atlantic might have come out after twisted wonderland became a thing but i just don't know what to expect basically is all i'm trying to say i don't know if there's going to be more there could be i hope there was but there's no telling <laughs> This video has basically been a blast from the past though. Each of these side chapters were released after I had gotten caught up on the manga and was interacting with the fandom more. And I remember reading some of them. I know I've read most of them. I don't, as I said earlier, I don't think I ever read the like fairy tale one, but I remember seeing um, screenshots of like certain panels of it. <laughs> but I do remember reading a lot of these chapters as they became available online and got circulated around Tumblr, and I remember all the fan discussion around certain chapters. It was such a nice break from the emotionally harrowing Emerald Witch arc and the Blue Cult arc, because 131, I think, if 131 is not smack dab in the middle of like the Blue Cult arc, it's around the same time as um, the flashback memory arc. Um, either way, a breath of fresh air from all of the trauma that's happening in the manga. <laughs> we needed these chapters as a fandom when they were dropped. Each of these side stories don't really add a whole lot to the overall story and at most only hint at or provide glimpses into personalities of characters we don't usually get to see much of, like Real Ciel and Vincent. But I love taking the time to really dive into the moments that wouldn't be explored in the actual manga. It's nice seeing the characters talk about things that are inconsequential pretty much and it's fun seeing scenarios like Arthur's dream play out. The ways that these side chapters play with our beloved characters is very reminiscent of fanfic honestly and I love that. I'm pretty sure there is someone out there who has written a fanfic like Sebastian pulling CL's tooth for the first time or an AU of these characters in fairy tales or maybe even a fanfic of what Sebastian's rest day could have looked like. I don't know if it played out the same, but I guarantee you somebody has written fanfics of these same premises. <laughs> That's just how fandom works. But also like that fanfic spin of, on things is what makes these bonus chapters so fun. My only regret is that they're just not easily accessible. This video was largely unscripted. I did read through the side chapters as I recorded this video to give you the play-by-play. -play. I think that was fairly obvious. I'm playing around with formatting and I also had a really hard time focusing on scripting this week. So I'm sorry if this ended up being a jumbled mess. I feel like it made sense, but I'm 
in my brain so I know the thoughts that are connecting things that may not actually get verbally connected. So sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, have you guys read these side chapters before? I can't really tell you where to read them. I just Google them and click on like the first link that pops up. And again, I don't think it's really wise to share where you're pirating things because I think that's what contributes to things getting taken down. At least that's been true in the past. Um, I don't really have solid answers on where to read all these chapters, especially like 131.5 is really hard to find online. And as you've noticed from the screenshots in this video, not super easy to find in high quality. But it is what it is, and I'm very grateful to all the fans who have translated these chapters and shared them online for us, because without those people, these chapters would be completely lost and inaccessible to non-Japanese fans, to people who cannot read Japanese, to the English-speaking fandom at large. Could you imagine a Black Butler fandom that couldn't refer back to the side chapter of Vincent Diedrich and Ciel cooking Rachel dinner <laughs> to characterize real Ciel and Vincent? What, what would we be without that? <laughs> but anyway, I think I rambled on long enough. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I will catch you all in the next one. I do want to say for my Black Butler besties, I am working on the Blue Cult Arc um, large video that I'm aiming to put out by the end of August. If not end of August, early September, I promise. It is coming very soon. And I've also got a video about season one that I've been very slowly low-key working on for the past year or so it's been an idea that I've had for a while and I've just been like coming back to it every every once in a while and, like making more progress <laughs> on the video don't expect it to be a video that actually looked like it took a year to make but yeah I was thinking about finishing that season one video sometime soon at least by the end of the year there's more black butler coming yeah that's also might be on a hiatus but I surely am not <laughs> Um, but anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. If you like Black Butler, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you like other anime, that's pretty slay too. I'm trying to talk about more than just Baldur's Gate and Black Butler. It's just that's what gets received very well right now, and I do like attention. So, it is what it is. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Goodbye!